Welcome. This is Things Concerning Himself, and I'm Pastor John Anderson. In these series of studies, we are looking at Old Testament stories that reveal the character and the mission of Jesus Christ. You remember that he said to the leaders of his day, speaking of the scriptures, which of course was the Old Testament of his time, these are they that testify or tell the story of me. And on the Emmaus Road, as he met up with those two travelers, the Bible says that he expounded unto them in all the scriptures, again, the Old Testament, the things concerning himself. So that's our purpose as we go through this series to look at Old Testament stories, symbols, tokens, and find the, the uh, reflection, the picture of Jesus in them. As we begin our study today, I invite you to bow your heads as we pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the Holy Bible. Thank you for the Old Testament and the way that it reveals Jesus, if we will but have our eyes opened by the illumination of the Holy Spirit. So we pray for that today as we study this most interesting story, that we'll see a picture of Jesus that will draw us to him. For he said, if I am lifted up, I will draw all to me. May that be our experience, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of our study today is Joseph, Our Brother on the Throne. Question, do you know anybody famous? Is there perhaps somebody in your family tree that is a person of note, somebody of historical significance? Maybe they came across on the Mayflower or, or uh, did something else that uh, was remarkable. Uh, actually, every single one of us knows somebody important and famous. We'll get to that just a little bit later. But first, I want to begin uh, by telling a story that, that uh, charmed my heart. It has to do with a young boy. His name was Roger, and he was maybe 8 or 10 years old, and he was with, with his family on an outing. They were going to a golf tournament, and there were large crowds at this tournament, and somehow Roger became separated from his parents and had no idea where he was. Had a bewildered look on his face, and then he looked up into a cheery smile of someone who uh, beamingly looked down on him and said, young man, you look like you're lost. And he said, yes, uh, yes, I am. He says, well, I have an idea. Why don't you walk with me? And I think that just maybe your parents will find you. And so this man, this kindly man, took young Roger by the hand, and they started walking down this, this uh, beautiful uh, grassy area. And the crowds turned their attention toward uh, the two of them. And sure enough, uh, Roger's parents spied him, and they were, they were reunited and uh, had a pleasant rest of the day. Who was the man that uh, rescued Roger that day? It was none other than golfing legend Arnold Palmer. And the ironic part of the story is that the Roger in the story, the young boy that was rescued by Arnold Palmer, uh, was Roger, or is Roger Maltby, who turned out himself to be a professional golfer and had the opportunity to play in tournaments with, uh, with his hero, Arnold Palmer. Now he serves as a golf analyst on TV. But as a young boy, can you imagine uh, the halo of respect that was given to him as he met up with his young friends and, uh, and, and they found out that Arnold Palmer had uh, taken him by the hand and marched down the fairway and, and uh, become, be, uh, became the center of attention and so on. What a moment. So Roger treasures that story. It was a time of his life he'll never forget. The question is, do you know somebody famous? And I'm going to tell you that you do. We're going to study today a story that uh, I believe reveals the, uh, 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 an outstanding picture of Jesus in the Old Testament, and it's found in the life experience of Joseph. We're going to find that Joseph's life reflects Jesus in at least six ways. And we'll, we'll start out here with the first one, and that is that among the people in the Bible of whom a significant portion is used to describe their life. There aren't too many uh, that are like Joseph that against whom there are no uh, character flaws recorded. There are no missteps that are, that are recorded in the Bible. Now, this doesn't mean that Joseph was sinless. Uh, he was a sinner like all of us and uh, needs God's grace in order to be saved. But there are, there are no imperfections that are recorded in the Bible. Uh, Joseph is one, uh, Daniel is another, but if you think about the Bible story, Abraham, uh, uh, his, he lost his faith and lied, and uh, uh, Jacob had his flaws, and David was a murderer, and Moses, and, and Saul, and Peter denied Christ, and uh, almost everybody in the Bible, there are, there are mistakes and sins recorded, but not Joseph. And in this way, in a, in a dim way, in, in a 
foreshadowing, he reflects Jesus, of course, who was absolutely sinless. The Bible says in Hebrews 4.15 that in all points he was tempted as we are, yet without sin. And Joseph, in the purity of his life, is a reflection of Jesus in the perfection of his life. No character flaws. And of course, that is the basis of our salvation, that Jesus came into this world and lived a perfect life, never made one mistake, either by thought or by deed, and in this way, his sacrifice was acceptable, and he became our example. Now, I can't explain how that could be. I can't explain how Jesus, being God, became man, a human, and was tempted as we are, and that he can be our example in that way, but uh, the Bible declares it to be so. And we have to have faith and believe that. Some people say, well, it was different for him. Uh, I have an excuse to sin because I'm not like, like Jesus. But that's not true. God has given us all the resources necessary to become overcomers and to live uh, in the, in the, uh, by the example of Jesus Christ. So Joseph, Joseph is a reflection of Christ in the fact that there are no mistakes recorded against him. And, of course, Jesus is the one that is altogether, altogether perfect. Now, secondly, we find that Joseph's life reflects Jesus in the way that he was treated by his kinfolk. Now, if you go back to the story, you find that uh, Joseph treated, uh, Jacob treated Joseph in a very special way. He was the oldest son of his beloved Rachel, the one that he wa had wanted to marry in the first place. And so, uh, ill-advisedly, he was shown favoritism. And this aroused the jealousy and the envy of the other brothers uh, and it led to his being mistreated by them. Uh, part of the basis of it was that, the, that uh, uh, Jacob used to provide a very special coat for Joseph. It was called a coat of many colors. And it expressed the, uh, the uh, favored treatment that he was given. In the Bible, it talks about in, in 2 Samuel 13, 18, talks about Tamar, one of the daughters of, of King David, that she had a robe of many colors for the king's virgin daughters wore such appar apparel. So it was a designation of something very special. And it was a, a red flag to the brothers. They, they became very jealous about Joseph because of that. Now, in some Bibles, it's not going to say a coat of many colors, it's going to say a long coat with sleeves. Uh, it has to do with uh, variations of translations and so on. But uh, even that expresses the same idea because it indicates special treatment. If you had a long coat with sleeves, then that would not be suitable uh, to work out in the fields. And so you, you were uh, given a special, special place by virtue of that. Uh, you can think of, um, in today's language, it would be as if the brothers were given coveralls and Joseph was given a tuxedo. So there was jealousy in the family, and favoritism is never a good thing. It led, in this case, to the mistreatment of Joseph, a reflection of what would happen to Jesus when he was on this earth. Jealousy would lead to mistreatment. Now, along with the coat of money colors, there was the dreams that Joseph had dreamed. He dreamed that they were out in the field, and they all piled their sheaves of, of uh, grain, and, and all the uh, sheaves of the brothers uh, bowed down toward his. And then he had another dream, and, and the bodies of heaven, the uh, planets and the stars, sun, moon, and stars, uh, paid obeisance or worship to him as well. And this also aroused the jealousy and the envy of, uh, of the rest of his family members. But they were prophecies. They were prophecies that came true literally in the life of Joseph, as we'll find out. So he was elevated eventually to become prime minister of Egypt, and the brothers did actually come and bow before him. Uh, but much more than that, it's a reflection of, of Jesus Christ, that though he was mistreated, he is the one who has been given the name of all, above all names and the one before whom every knee will bow. So those dreams were prophetic. So one day, Jacob sent Joseph out to inquire on the welfare of his brothers. He caught up with him at Dothan. And again, maybe ill-advisedly, he was wearing this special coat, the coat of many colors. The Bible says the brothers uh, saw him afar off, and they had nothing but disdain and ridicule. They said, oh, here comes this dreamer. Let's kill him. Wow. Let's kill him. We'll find out what will become of his dream. So they threw him into a pit as they kind of formulated their plans. But Reuben, the eldest, maybe feeling a little more responsible, uh, said, oh, uh, let's not kill him just yet. And 
apparently then Reuben wandered off for a little ways and uh, a, a uh, caravan of Ishmaelites on their way to Egypt, some traders, came by and Joseph was bartered for 20 pieces of silver and he was sent on his way to slavery in, uh, in Egypt. Reuben was not a part of that. He was uh, very sorry and disappointed uh, by, by what had happened, but nevertheless, that's what took place. Now, the reasoning that was given when they sold him was that, well, we're not going to raise our hand against him directly. <clears throat> and they thought that that would excuse their guilt in the matter because the truth of it was that to be sent into slavery to Egypt was uh, essentially a death decree. The lifespan of those who served as slaves in Egypt was not very long. So it was a death sentence that they gave, but they, they thought that because they weren't personally involved, that they would be uh, ex exempt from responsibility. But that's not the way that God looks at things. He, he could connect the dots in it, and they were indeed accountable. It's the same as in the story of David when he sent Uriah uh, uh, under the uh, direction of Joab to be placed in the hottest part of the battle, and then be, uh, they would withdraw from him, and, and Uriah would be killed so that could, David could uh, then have Bathsheba, Uriah's wife. And David thought that he was innocent because it wasn't his hand that had been raised against Uriah. And yet, from God's point of view, it was as if it was David's hand that killed him directly. And so in this case, uh, the brothers might have thought that they weren't guilty by, of uh, Joseph's death because uh, the Ishmael, Ishmaelites were going to take him to Egypt. But uh, they absolutely played an important part of that and it did, did not remove their, their guilt. Now, the third point that we see a reflection of Jesus in the story of Joseph. This is the most interesting thing. Sometimes the little details of the Bible um, gleam like stars. When we find that the Ishmaelites are coming by, and Reuben is not present at this time, so he's not part of this transaction, but we find that one of the brothers proposes the sale and says, we might, what profit is there if we, if we uh, uh, let Joseph die in this pit? Let's at least sell him and we'll get something out of it. And so they made an, uh, an arrangement with the Ishmaelites and they collected 20 shekels of silver. That would be two shekels each, 10 brothers being there. And um, off Joseph went. Who was it that proposed that sale? Who was it that stood up and said, it's no profit if we just uh, kill him or nothing. Let's, let's uh, uh, sell him to the Ish Ishmaelites. It was somebody, one of the uh, 12 sons, and his name was Judah. Judah, the fourth son of Jacob, Judah. He was the one that, that uh, uh, bartered his brother, sold him for the price of a slave. Now, that's interesting because we find that uh, uh, some 17 centuries later or so on, uh, Jesus is on earth. And one of the 12 uh, is going to negotiate a, uh, a price to sell him, to betray him. And what is his name? Well, you know his name, but before we say it out loud, let me point out that in the Old Testament, we have names, and many times when those names migrated to the New Testament from Hebrew to Greek, uh, they went, uh, underwent slight changes. So that, especially if you have a King James Bible, you'll notice that Isaiah in the Old Testament is called Isaiah in the New Testament. Jeremiah, Jeremiah, Elijah, Elias, Judah, Judas. So... Judas of the New Testament has the same name. It's just that it's now pronounced from the Greek point of view. But he has the very same name as the one that negotiated that sale that put Joseph into slavery. Interesting. So there's a reflection of Jesus in the story, even of how he was sold by one with the uh, same name as the one that later betrayed Christ. Now, as Joseph was sold, the Bible says he was 17 years old. Uh, somehow he did a lot of growing up on that road to Egypt. And he determined that even though his brothers had mistreated him, he was going to be faithful to God. This was a life-changing moment for him. And he made a decision that he was not going to spend his life uh, pining and murmuring. Of course, there was tears of anguish and disappointment, but he was not going to spend his life uh, uh, bewailing his misfortune. He was going to serve the Lord. And no matter what God had planned for him, uh, he was going to do his best. And we find that, and we're reading now from Genesis 39, we find that when uh, Joseph came into Egypt, that he was sold uh, into the hands of one whose name was Potiphar. And Potiphar, it says, was an officer of Pharaoh, a captain of the guard. Um, actually, other translations or margins would tell you that that meant that he was chief of the slaughtermen. So he had an interesting job. He's the one that purchased Joseph 
And Joseph is now serving in the house of, house of Potiphar. And I want to read verse 2 of chapter 39 there. It's very important. It says, The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man. That's an interesting phrase. From an earthly point of view, I don't think that too many people would call Joseph successful. His brothers had betrayed him. He was now serving as a slave in Egypt. The future looked dim. Uh, would he ever see his family again? And yet two things the Bible tells us in that verse. The Lord was with him, and he was successful. You see, the world measures success by a, a, a different yardstick. It's uh, the size of the house you live in, or, or the, uh, uh, the car you drive, or the, the uh, amount that you have in your stock portfolio, or whatever. That's how the world measures success. But heaven measures it differently. Heaven measures success uh, according to our relationship to the Lord and our attitude as we serve in whatever circumstance, adverse though it may be. So you may be in a situation and you may look at uh, the circumstances that surround you and you say, how in the world can I be a success? I'm a nobody. I'm a failure. I haven't accomplished anything. And yet from heaven's point of view, just like Joseph in this story, you may be a success. If the Lord is with you, and you're doing your best to follow his will, you are successful, no matter how the world might measure success. We all want to be successful, but we want to be successful according to the way that heaven looks at it. And that phrase, uh, the Lord was with Joseph, is repeated three times in this chapter. As Joseph goes from the house of Potiphar and then ends up being in prison, uh, it still says that the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, this is verse 23 of chapter 39, the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it to prosper. And this tells us that no matter where we are, even though our name may not be in lights, and it's never going to be on, on the front of a, uh, some news magazine or something like that, we can be successful if the Lord is with us and we're doing what he wants us to do in our life. That's the story of Christ, too. Many people, to look at Jesus' life, especially if you put it on pause Friday afternoon at the cross. Uh, they, they would question whether this Galilean teacher was a success. Um, look at his history. He was born in a cattle barn. He was raised in a city that had a stigma for wickedness, Nazareth. He never obtained a degree, he never wrote a book, never had a bank account. And when he died, his followers either, either rejected and, and uh, attacked him or they, they fled. And so if you put his life on pause Friday, uh, would you count the life of Jesus a success? And yet absolutely it was. The Lord was with him and whatever he did prospered. And of course, we are looking at it differently 2,000 years later. We realize that Jesus came forth from the grave and he's now at the right hand of God in heaven. But think about his life up to that moment, and would you have uh, spoken of it? Would you have thought of it as being successful? Or would you have thought of Joseph in the house of Potiphar or in the, in the dungeon, the prison, as a success? And yet, he absolutely was from heaven's point of view. Jesus lived out the plan that God had given him to do, and the Lord was with him in every respect. Let's go on to um, the next part of the story. Joseph was trustworthy and an able administrator, and so is Jesus. This, in this way, he reflects Christ. What we're referring to here is the fact that when he was in Potiphar's house, we're told in verse 6, that Potiphar left all that he had in Joseph's hand. He did not know what he had except for the bread that he ate. Potiphar came to realize that when Joseph was in charge, things went well, and that he could uh, step back and not be involved in uh, the, the details of his life, and it would turn out to be a blessing. And so Potiphar had a happy existence. Uh, Potiphar, somebody might ask, uh, uh, how, how's, your, how's your stocks doing? And he'd say, I, I don't know a thing about it. Joseph handles all that. And he would say it with a smile, knowing that uh, it was good. And in this sense, we, we need the Potiphar perspective. We need to put everything in Jesus' hands, just as Potiphar put him in Joseph's hands, because Jesus is going to take care of everything for us. We don't need to live in anxiety and worry and fear if everything that we have is put in Christ's hands, if we will trust him, if we will uh, return our tithe to him and acknowledge that he is owner of all, we can relax and have a carefree existence as Potiphar did because Jesus is in charge. 
And just as Joseph was faithful and Potiphar could rest easy, how much more you and I can rest easy because as, as able an administrator as Joseph might have been, Jesus is the sovereign of the universe. He guides the stars. So we don't need to worry if we put everything in his hands. Now, number six as we come to it. Actually, before that, we need to uh, address another point here, and that is that while he was in Potiphar's house, a false accusation was leveled against him by Potiphar's wife. Joseph, the Bible says, <clears throat> was a handsome man. And that shouldn't surprise us because he was the son of Rachel, and the Bible tells us that she was very fair to look upon. And as Joseph worked in there, remember he was sold when he was 17, and so he's in Potiphar's house in his late teens and his early 20s, the prime of manhood, and uh, he becomes attractive to Potiphar's wife, and she uh, wants to seduce him. She propositions him. And Joseph says, I can't do that. Now, it's interesting that Joseph knows that this is wrong, and he even calls it a sin. And the story of Joseph in the Bible takes place before the Annunciation of the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. Some people have the mistaken idea that God's law did not exist before it was written in stone by God's finger on the top of Mount Sinai and, and spoken by his mouth. But that's not true. God's law had always been in existence. Abraham knew that it was wrong to lie. Cain knew that it was wrong to murder. Joseph knew that committing adultery was a sin. So he said, how can I sin and do this great wickedness against God? Uh, but nevertheless, she continued to pester him. Now, um, we, we don't have the video of what that uh, might have looked at, but I get the impression that um, they were well-versed in cosmeto cosmetology back in Egypt. They knew how to highlight the eyes, and, and they knew how to dress in a seductive way. There's, there's actually evidence that the gowns that the ladies wore back uh, in that day were so sheer that if you took a one-inch ring, a one-inch ring, you could draw the garment through it. That'll give you a picture of how sheer a garment it might have been. Try to imagine taking this coat, for example, and passing it through a one-inch ring. Impossible. So Potiphar's wife was continually seducing uh, Joseph, but he was resisting her. It came to the point where one time she grabbed onto his clothing, and in order to escape, he ran from her. And so this is the second time in Joseph's life when he is stripped of his garments as the uh, enemies have, have attacked. His brothers stripped him of his coat of many colors, and he's stripped of his garment here as he escapes the uh, clutches of Potiphar's wife. Jesus was also stripped of his garments, wasn't he? On the cross, it talks about how they bartered for his garments and um, uh, divided up his, his clothing that way. You know, artists, for good reason, uh, paint Jesus on the cross with, with a loincloth. But back, back when that happened, there, there was no clothing. All garments were removed. It was part of the humiliation of the experience. So Joseph reflects the life of Jesus in many ways. And yet, we find that Joseph, though he was tempted, remained faithful to God. And Jesus remained faithful despite the accusations and the temptations that came to him. What is the purpose of our life? I might ask you this question. What is the purpose of our life? Our, the purpose of our life is to allow the Holy Spirit to come into our, into our hearts and change us so that we reflect the life of Jesus and resist evil and say no to sin. And in that way, he can reshape us and reform us to be reflections of Christ, as Joseph was a reflection of Christ, by saying no to temptation. I know some people say, no, that's not possible. We'll just go on sinning. Uh, we're, we're incapable of becoming overcomers. But that's not true. That flies in the face of the gospel because the Bible says that Jesus came to save us from our sins. And Joseph was a reflection of Christ in his resistance to evil. Uh, some people think the purpose of life is to get more money or, or somehow be famous. No, the purpose of this life is to grow into the likeness of Christ by resisting sin through the power of the Holy Spirit. When God made man, it says that he said, let us make man in our own image after our own likeness. And even though sin came in and marred the picture, created a detour, still that's God's express purpose. And Joseph was experiencing that. He was being shaped into the image of Christ by allowing the Holy Spirit to give him power to resist evil. And that should be our objective as well as we go through life. Let me point you to this passage here 
in Philippians chapter 3 and verses 20 and 21. Important text, Philippians 3, 20 and 21. Paul says, our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he's able to even to subdue all things to himself. That's a beautiful promise to think that someday Jesus is going to come back and he's going to change our, our lowly or our mortal bodies, the bodies that are subject to disease and decay. He's going to change our bodies to be that, like that of Jesus. But notice what the text does not say. It does not say that Jesus is coming back to change our minds or to change our characters. That work must be done, must be done now. He's coming back to change our bodies, but he's not coming back to change our characters. Whatever changes are brought into our characters to bring them into alignment with God's will, that process to take place now. And we can't listen to the devil that says, no, it's impossible to overcome. No, everything that God requires of us, we can become through the grace of Christ. And Joseph was an illustration of that. Joseph was a reflection of Christ in the period of his character and the fact that he resisted sin. Now, if I don't allow that to happen, I'm actually uh, breaking the ninth commandment or the eighth commandment. The eighth commandment forbids stealing. And you might say, well, how am I breaking the commandment if I don't do that? Well, I'm robbing myself of the blessing of becoming like Jesus. I'm ro robbing other people who need to see what a Christian looks like. And I'm robbing God of the glory that, does, that, that, uh, that he deserves by changing my life and my character. Well, ultimately, Joseph was in prison, but because of two dreams that he correctly interpreted, he was brought out of the prison, and he was made prime minister of Egypt. And in this, he is a reflection of Jesus. The devil thought that he had Joseph just where he wanted him, in the dungeon, in the pit. But the Lord had other plans. And in the same way, the, Lord, the, the devil thought that he had Jesus right where he wanted him, when he had him on the cross, and then he had him in the tomb. But such was not to be. Christ burst forth from the tomb and is at the right hand of God. And Joseph's being brought out of the prison to serve as prime minister at the right hand of the highest power on earth at that time, the Pharaoh of Egypt, is a reflection of Jesus. We see G Jesus so many ways in the life of Joseph. And what a beautiful picture it is. What a picture of encouragement. Our brother on the throne. Do you know somebody famous? Absolutely you do. If you are a Christian... You are a part of the family of God, and Christ claims you as, his, as being uh, your brother. You know somebody famous. Someday, we'll get to see him face to face. And what a day that will be. May the Lord prepare us for that time, each one of us, as we look forward to the coming of Jesus and the consummation of God's plan of salvation.